Whether you are thinking about becoming a restaurateur or you are already in the business, Michael Politz has written a must read, The Food and Beverage Magazine's Guide to Restaurant Success. Pick up your copy today at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Books a Million, or wherever fine books are sold. Food and Beverage Magazine Live, bringing food and beverage to life with your hosts, James Beard Award winner Jennifer English and Food and Beverage Magazine publisher Michael Politz. Featuring leaders in the hospitality, branded food and beverage, and CPG industries, many of whom are Jennifer and Michael's friends in the business. For an informal and informative conversation where friends in the business share the latest intel, ideas, and best practices. Live, juicy inside scoop from the tastemakers, newsmakers, bread bakers, drink shakers, spoon lickers, clam diggers, farms, foodies, and friends of the food and beverage magazine world. Here are your hosts, Jennifer English and Michael Politz. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Jennifer English. I'm the editor-at-large of Food and Beverage Magazine, and I am absolutely thrilled to welcome you as we head into the dog days of summer. Don't you wish you had a cool and quenching sip? And don't you wish that this was the kind of summer you could just press pause and enjoy this moment for some time? creating moments and taking advantage of the opportunities that that life gives us is how we enrich our every day with food and drink with hospitality and conviviality those are the things that matter the most that's why we've turned to our guest today dia sims for some advice about how to do all of those things. They're all in her wheelhouse of expertise. She may be the single best person we speak to all summer about how to have extraordinary experiences and how to have moments and how to really develop not only your personal brand, but to connect both with community and around the table by clinking glasses. And she's got a lot of wonderful ideas to share with us today, as well as a story that I think everybody in the hospitality industry who, by the way, are the community of readers of Food and Beverage Magazine, 14 million readers every month, are looking for our friends in the business to guide us about where we are in our time and place in food, beverage, and hospitality. We call it Food 3.0, post-pandemic. Where are we and where are we headed? For that, we turn to our guest today, the incomparable Dia Sims, who joins us with her 1707 Tequila and Mezcal, known as Lobos 1707. She's the founder and CEO. She's also the co-founder of Pronghorn. We'll talk to her a little bit about that. But I raise my proverbial glass of Mezcal, which is the official drink of the 22 Club, and we welcome you. How are you, Dia? I am doing great, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. What a great introduction, by the way. I need to send this to my mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So. I love the idea that we can turn to you as our friend in the business to help us understand we are all collectively in our industry in a very different place. I'm going to start by asking you, where do you think not only are we right now, but where do you think we're going? Yeah, listen, we've gone through like it's, it's, it's been beat up, right? But we really actually lived through unprecedented time. There's just no better American English word to describe it. Um, and I hope, I hope, and it feels to me genuinely that we've come through it with a bit more appreciation, you know, for our time, for our communion, and how special these moments that can seem casual, but those moments around being at a table, whether you're hosting at your own home, whether you're at, you know, the Michelin five-star restaurant, right? Those moments... Um, I almost feel like the waiting of each second in our life has now gotten like double waiting, right? We really right. realize like, you know what? <laughs> you know what? Just going to your neighborhood restaurant has a different level of magic. Um, and as, as crazy as these times have been, I'm, I'm actually really grateful for that because particularly the work that goes into hospitality, whether it's, you know, I'm so proud to be behind a phenomenal tequila right. or whether it's just a great restaurant, everybody's hands that touches that, I don't know that they've always been celebrated and recognized for it um, and what it takes to have a great time, a great meeting. I think, um, you know, I'm hopeful that that's one thing that as we go forward, that we're, we're so respectful of the journey 
of food and beverage to get to our table to make those moments so special. I hope you don't mind if I impose a question that I really think you're well suited to answer. You're a branding expert. And I wanted to turn to you. What if I were to ask you to become the marketing consultant, the branding expert for hospitality and conviviality as a concept for our industry? It's certainly what unites us. It's not just what's in the glass. It's the entire experience. As a branding guru, where could we help? How can we help people understand what we're talking about when we talk about this moment in time, when we talk about hospitality and conviviality? I think um, the first thing is I would think through service, right? And this is not just a hospital. Like it seems like a foregone conclusion, but, but it is almost, you know, I often say it's almost like in a state of emergency, um, mm -hmm. it, honestly. And it is the, it is just the most beautiful compliment right if you come to my house i i'm gonna i want to be the best i want to serve you right i want to make sure that i'm thinking of everything that i know your food preferences and your allergies and i remember your favorite drink right when i was in my 20s um a long time ago um we used to promote these big parties every week and the reason why i think we did well it wasn't that of course we tried to have the great music and this and that but we would remember when you walk in i'd say oh lucy i know she likes her you know her dark and stormy and i know this person prefers that and it's just a it's just the greatest way to build community is to, I think, really recognize one another. And from a branding standpoint, I'm a fan. And I think it's another thing kind of going by the wayside of just an old fashioned toast. Right. And I think if you think I, about how do you, like, how do you showcase in a short, like 10 second way of what does it mean to have hospitality? Mm -hmm. Right. Like I think starting to revive those moments of toasting to one another, even, you know, when I was young, people memorized like special toast and cheers to each other. And I think it's really, it's, it's, it's not just the actual moment of drinking and having a shot or champagne or whatever you're having. It's also like the acknowledgement of all of this we're doing, it's kind of whack if we're not doing it in communion with each other. And I think so, that's a beautiful, you know, the beautiful way to show, showcase it. Let's tie this together with your brand, Lobo 1707 Tequila and Mezcal and talk about how those things are brought to life by you and your team and how the Lobo 1707 Tequila and Mezcal are an expression of your intention of hospitality and conviviality. No, absolutely. The name Lobos means wolves in Spanish. And our founder's family has been in the spirits industry since the 1700s, which is the reason why we call it 1707. Um, so when you talk about like, family and communion like we this is the realest it can get this is not, I, don't get me wrong i've been in plenty of uh, a conference room where we kind of made up a concept and then backed into the reason lobo 1707 is not that we tell the actual truth about community and family the other thing that's really interesting is since i've become um since i since we came up with this I have learned so much about wolves, right? So you think about community and think about how a wolf pack actually moves. You know, wolves actually it are so interdependent, right? You have the alpha female, you have the alpha male. If a wolf is infirm in the pack, actually sometimes wolves will take care of that sick wolf. We don't even have that in some of our neighborhoods <laughs> as people, right? Um, and how they actually have an interesting system where they know they thrive better together than apart, right? So we tried to build our organization, not just a brand proposition, but the actual company down to like, we're fortunate to be backed by luminaries like Arnold Schwarzenegger and LeBron James. So we picked an office space in New York that's really kind of like the cultural center point that is an office we open up to the community. So we've gone to the community and said, you want to have your meetings in here? You can come at your artist and you want to have a place to do a pop-up gallery? Use our space, right? Because we want to, we want to really um, transport and, and really show that feeling of what it means to be a wolf man. We, we even call it the den as an example. And then down to the liquid, even, even the bottle shape. Um, I've been in the industry over 25 years on the spirit side and I'm remembering those days when I would have parties, some bottles when you hold your hand are actually hard to hold. So if you're thinking about somebody, a mixologist who's pouring, we made sure that our bottle is actually easy to hold. And that may seem like a simple, small thing, but when you think about hospitality and communion, it is thinking about the experience, right, of the person that you're with and then putting a liquid in the bottle and award winning we're so proud to have won over 40 awards in the last 10 months that we can be proud of that you want to you when it's your friends you want to give them the best you want them to walk out your house like Shoo, they put me on to this new this and that and that's exactly what we went for with lobos 1707. you are living the lessons of the lobos 
You nailed it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's the headline, yes. right? You yes. want to know how to thrive? Stay yes. together. Take yes. care of each other. Take care yes. of each other. I yes. love that. I love, love, love that. So, you know, what's really funny. You may not remember this, but historically, I always ask brands in a way that tells me who they are, what their house toast is. Because if you are in the business of the poor, you're in the business of the toast and sip and connection. And it's always interesting to me to learn about who someone is by how they choose to represent the ritual of the toast. I love that you started with that. Because I almost finish every interview with, what's the house toast of Lobo 1707? So in the middle of the interview, I'm going to say, what's the house toast of Lobo 1707? So what we actually is, is legacy, love, Lobos. And it's talking about where we came from, why we do it, and why the liquid is really the superstar of what we of what we represent. And we typically, if, if you've never had it, often I will start with our reposado, simply neat, or maybe with a lime, and then we, we typically just do a toast there. Now we have four expressions, our hoven, our reposado, our extra añejo, and our mezcal. But I think the reposado is such a beautiful kind of balance of the best of both worlds right. and a perfect introduction to the, uh, to the mark. Now, I am a mezcal and agave spirits uh, person in general, but could you talk a little bit about the mezcal? Yeah, so I really, um, we're really proud of the response we've been getting from our mezcal, obviously from Oaxaca, and it's kind of, it's a beautiful all black bottle, and it's kind of the, if I can say, it's a little bit like the badass of the group, if you will. The thing that I love about it is, I, I, I'll i drink often like a smoky Paloma made with our mezcal, and one of the things that's cool about it is if you try the wrong mezcal first, you can be turned off, right? Entirely. You can feel like you're, you know, the proverbial looking up barbecue grill, right? But what I think because all of our expressions are finished in sherry cask, uh, Pedro Jimenez sherry cask, it gives the mezcal a little bit of softness, makes the viscosity really lovely, but it still has all the authenticity and the smokiness that you get from the volcanic pits. It's the reason why it's black is we're honoring um, the, the soil, right, in Oaxaca for our mezcal. So it has been extremely well received by the mixology community. Obviously, mezcal is growing like crazy. Um, and like I said, for me, Sundays, that's I have a smoky paloma with, our, with my mezcal and it's, it's terrific. Gives a little character. We, we absolutely love. So I, I co-host a radio show called Metabite with Akash Patel. We're the co-founders of the 22 Club, which is a micro community. Oh, yes. And Akash Patel is the, is the uh, founder of the Mezcal Hotel. So we are passionate about this. And of course, I first discovered Mezcal when Ron Cooper brought it to North America for most of us to discover. And he was a great ambassador for the category. And if you fast forward from that moment to now, can you talk a little bit about the difference between tequila and mezcal? Because it is very much the difference between, I'm going to use a, 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 a weak analogy, but it's the one that's coming immediately to mind. It's the difference between a Scottish whiskey and an American Kentucky whiskey. They're both whiskeys, but they couldn't, and they're sort of from the same DNA, but they right. really are expressions that couldn't be more different from one another. They come from the same roots, but they're really very different by the time you have them in your hands and your glass. For people who haven't discovered mezcal yet, how do you describe that difference between mezcal and tequila? Yeah, I think the it's exactly right. Same origin, same kind of base DNA, but on your like at your glass level. Um, if you're not, let's say you don't drink spirits, you don't know much of the difference, you would potentially think they're dramatically different, right? You might think that they're actually not related. Uh, I think even more so um, than, the, than the difference between kind of the whiskeys as described. The mezcal process in and of itself is still so authentic, right? You're talking real donkeys, you're talking about, you're talking <laughs> like, it's like the, it's, like, it's the real deal. And, and frankly- I love those robot donkeys. <laughs> You keep saying those robot donkeys. We're all about the real deal. I think, um, you know, it's interesting. The American palate has gotten so used to a lot of 
kind of like fake food and fake drinks, a lot of things that are not natural. I think mez the mezcal process is so um, authentic and then it kind of comes through, right, when you, in, in every sip. Um, and then not to, and I could go on about agave spirits at large, right? I think there's a lot of opportunities for agave as a category. Um, you know, tequila is just now getting, I think the appropriate respect, right? I don't think people realize kind of the agricultural brilliance, the family, the generations of families that know precisely when to take the piña and know how to cook it right in the oven, right? So I think tequila is at an interesting point in its, in its history in this country of starting to get the recognition that it deserves. I, I, even as fast as it's been growing and you know we're all reading the results, I actually think it still has so much room to grow because so many people still don't know that like our extra añejo, when you, um, you know, you talk about from like planting to your glass, including the fact that we're aging in these sherry barrels, you know, you're talking about 11, 12 years, right? To get to your, to get to your glass. And, and um, I, I think there's so much opportunity for us to educate on it. Even within our own marks, we start with a hoven, right? Whereas most tequila start with a completely unaged, like a Blanco right. or platinum or silver, because of the fact that it just doesn't make sense because all of our, uh, finishes have that sherry finish, we wanted to give the customer a little bit more for their dollar, a little bit of our repo, a little bit of that sherry aging, and it really shows up in a beautiful way. Um, so, I mean, my view is a category at large. I, I think there's, I think we have a lot more to come. We look at Bacanora or, or I see as things that are coming on the, in the future. I, I, it's something I'm really bullish about. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And we're not even beginning to talk about all of the benefits of it, all of the abuelas that drink one sip of tequila or mezcal every day because it does so many wonderful things. How people who are renowned for their attention to their health and wellness have stopped drinking things like wine and begun sipping really yeah. good clean tequila and mezcal. Yeah. There's a reason where, why we're becoming aware of the benefits of the plants. And, and I don't even want to go down that, that rabbit hole because there is just so much there. And of course, all things in moderation. But it's really important to talk about where tequila and mezcal are going. What kind of parties are they going to? What kind of things are happening with tequilas and mezcals right now that you're most excited about? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, um, look, they're incredibly versatile, right? So I think just like your spirits, your occasion will uh, can sometimes dictate what your what your partner spirit is. But I, what I would say is, whereas tequilas were previously at this, um, I don't know, hyper casual, not being taken seriously, you know, utility, right? Versus an enjoyment, right? Versus for a chance for actual communion versus to be able to sip. And, and, and you're starting to see it now at elegant dinners. You're starting to see it now, you know, at beautiful award shows. You're starting to see it when you are celebrating an incredible accomplishment or when you want to have that moment to toast something to say like, hey, I'm just I'm just darn glad to be in relationship with you. Some of your dearest friends, some of your family. Um, and you want to actually show your respect for them. Now tequila's, tequila has risen to the occasion of saying like, I care about this you so much. I've gotten you the best, right? I'm celebrating with the best. And just just eight years ago, that wasn't the case at all, like at all. So it's it's delightful to see the doors that you now find tequila in. I think Mezcal is still on that discovery journey. Um, and in some ways that's really cool. Sometimes you have to go out your way to find it. And that, that to me, discovery sometimes is the, the most fun part, right? About the food and beverage energy, uh, rather uh, industry. So sometimes you, you gotta know the right mixologist. You gotta know the, the right bar for people to serve you the perfect mezcal in the right way, particularly with mezcal cocktails. If you are, if you put mezcal in the hands of someone who doesn't know what they're doing, it might not be balanced in the right way. You almost have to have like the right pharmacokinetic profile, which is an overstatement, but you got to treat it with the seriousness it deserves and make sure you're showing off the liquid with the right melody. Listen, I am so excited. I would love to do a spirited dinner with you because there's a reason why I think the agave spirits are coming into their awareness and renowned right now. And that's because America has changed the way we eat. I'm not going to drink a sip of a reposado tequila if I'm having like chicken cordon bleu. It's like, it's like a cultural disconnect in a way. Right. However, if you gave me a brilliant hoven or silver tequila and I'm having a spicy, oh. I'm having a spicy 
you know where I'm going with this. I'm having a spicy chicken sandwich. I'm having a hot and spicy fried chicken sandwich that has that like double crisp on it and a little bit of pickle. What's happening culturally around the country right now? We're embracing the tablecloth is moving out of our consciousness and pure delicious in all of its expressions from ethnic foods to the simple and humble expressions of excellence that come in the form of like, like a Nashville hot chicken sandwich. Yes. If you start thinking about how we've changed the way we eat and the way that these flavors beckon the agave spirits, they don't just pair well. They're screaming like, please wa wash me down with this. Think of it this way. When we talk about pleasure and satisfaction, bitter, sour, salty, sweet, and umami are the five things that make any bite or sip more complex and delicious. The more you get of each one of those things in any bite or sip, the more pleasurable those bites and sips are going to be, the more satisfaction you're going to get from them. When you get something like a, like a Nashville hot chicken sandwich with pickles and hot and spicy and crunchy and salty and fatty and all that stuff, and you have it paired so beautifully with the sweetness and then the complexity and the vegetal and the fruit notes of a great tequila, you can see how that goes well together, right? So all of a sudden, I can see the broad range of agave spirits on the tequila side pairing beautifully with those flavors. We're also falling in love again with barbecues. We have smoke masters and pit masters all over the country. You don't just have to go to Texas for brisket or Carolina for a whole hog anymore. You can take these flavors that we're just madly in love with at this moment and pair them with an exquisite mezcal because those are the foods we're choosing to eat right now. This is the spirit we're choosing to go with it. That's my that's my soapbox. That's a way. That's a this beyond it's like a it's like a missionary statement. Like I feel converted. I mean, I, I think the agave spirits are kind of a siren song, right, to the evolution of where the American palate is right now, which I think is actually, if this is not sacrilegious to say on this, on, <laughs> on this, it is is bigger than food. It's actually about yes. how our values are shifting to experiences, right? So when you look at data from the you know Gen Z and all of us are going through this where, you know, I grew up mostly in the 90s where a lot of value was driven by, you know, cash and flash, right? We have an enormous pivot, I think the right pivot of like, no, 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 actually real experiences, exploration, discovery, and communion is the actual value. And what better a company, I think, to that, right, is Agave Spirits. And from a flavor profile standpoint, you just, I mean, I cannot say it more beautifully than you just did. But when you start to have these exploratory real um, I don't know, it's like real food, right? Then then the way, whether it's the right hoven or, you know, the beautiful pairing with the extra añejo, it's a nice complement um, to the way things are going, even tacos. We do a huge Taco Tuesday program. And I often love to share the history of tacos in this country where all of these Mexican women entrepreneurs at a time when there were not women entrepreneurs being widely accepted, right? Like feeding their families with these taco carts, um, you know, it's now become something you can get it in all the kind of most elevated ways with the sprinkle of caviar or your tacos, which wasn't the way, but it's because it's a good, delicious food and there's nothing um, that has to be so fake hoity toity, right? About having something that's delicious. Delicious is delicious, right? And it shouldn't have to come from a certain source. To your point, a terrific sandwich in Nashville, it's actually just delicious. <laughs> like, let's just uh, take away the pretense, take away the pretense, if you will. Right. And when you look at why we love tacos right now, why tacos are having this moment culturally, literally from the East Coast to the West Coast, it's because they deliver on those bitter, sour, salty, sweet, new mommy five notes and they nail it. They absolutely nail it. And the assignment for everybody is to get some 1707 Mezcal. And I want you to find the, the place in your town because guess what? Great barbecue is happening everywhere. I want you to try Burnt Ends. Wash down with a little sip of 1707 mezcal. Nice. I'm, I'm, just, I'm I want you to imagine that that just subtle sweetness and then the t slightly bitter note from the char of the blackened edges, from the, the the sort of fatty unctuousness, the saltiness that's intrinsic to that. 
and then how well that pairs with the high, bright, sweet notes and then the smoke notes of the mezcal. Jennifer, you're like food church. I need to like. <laughs> and you're agave church. It's a good thing we met. <laughs> it's like one of those weddings where you have like a priest and a rabbi. <laughs> That's so fun. Hey, listen, I don't want to keep you longer. I mean, I literally, I could, I could talk with you all day. And we should tell people that that you've got a series of events and you do a lot of activations to bring these brands to life. And you're also the co-founder of Pronghor. I want to give you a chance to to before we run out of time, talk about that a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Please do follow us, Lobo seventeen oh seven. We just had a beautiful event at Caravana up in Toronto. Um, you know, we're we're in forty four states and and Canada, and Mexico. But on Pronghorn, I'll be succinct. Um, but essentially, what we pulled together with Pronghorn was a template on how to effectively diversify any industry at all. And we're starting with the spirits industry and we're starting with the black community. As I mentioned, I've been in spirits for about 25 years on and off. i uh, previously been involved in building a brand called Turok Baca um, that became really successful. And it opened my eyes to like, hey, this is an, honestly, it's just an incredible industry. It's a huge, awesome industry of which um, there's an opportunity for us to invite more people to the table. Uh, and the way the initiative works is it's a 10 year initiative, $2.4 billion impact. Diageo, um, you know, big multinational supplier came on as our anchor investor. And uh, we are investing in 57 black owned spirits and driving 1,800 new um, black employees into the industry. And the short of it is um, two important things. The reason why we call it pronghorn is the pronghorn, if you're not familiar, is an amazing animal, kind of looks like um, an elk, but it's actually it's actually not, uh, actually closely related to a giraffe, long story, I'm a geek, and in Montana, that goes incredibly fast, um, it's the second fastest land mammal in the world, actually fastest in America, second only to the cheetah, and the cheetah would be a, a pronghorn in a sprint, but in a marathon, the pronghorn will win every single time, and when we looked at like what will it take to diversify an industry? Um, we knew that we had to be in it for the long run to make sure that the results would reverberate in the future. Um, and we're really it's excited. The about perseverance. Perseverance, absolutely, absolutely. And it's about it's about growing the industry, right? So I often say some of the challenge with the way people are viewing diversity right now is as if it's a game of musical chairs. It, it absolutely is not, right? If you are doing it correctly, it should be about building a bigger table for the betterment of everyone involved. Before we let you go, for people who are in the business and reimagining the acts, large and small, of service and hospitality, which is really the, the main reason I wanted to and was so excited to have you on today. I have admired your career and you have always managed to distill, pardon the pun, the human connection where these events are activated. You bring things to life. You have an expertise of doing that that's reflective of an appreciative of the time in which it's happening. Can you talk to the people who are with us in the Food and Beverage Magazine family, all of whom, many of whom are in the business somewhere out in the country, and they're rethinking and reimagining what it is to make hospitality? What are the things you can advise us? What is the advice you have for all of us about being in service and hospitality at you this know, moment? I, I can't overstate kind of two things. I think it's, it's service plus sensory, right? And I, I, this is too, I might be having it too simplified, but these are really the ways in which we've built any event, any invitation. And whether that's one person coming over for lunch whether that's even I just, you know, I had a contractor here earlier today. I want to make sure that they have a, like a beautiful cold glass of water, a beautiful glass that's being served in. Right. I think it's such a it's so important to remember from a base of gratitude. I think we can take for granted that like this is a pretty incredible industry that we're fortunate to be a part of. Um, but the industry has to be rooted in service. I think this is the air. I think this is the airline industry's biggest mistake that they don't realize you're actually in the hospitality industry. What does that word actually mean and how the returns, the business returns. And this has been, I'm grateful, has been my experience. Being service forward has always led to higher returns over and over again. And it comes down to the basics. And I learned this very early on from this like guru of hospitality in D.C., a gentleman named Mark Barnes, and then honed it um, working for Puff Daddy for 14 years, who's known as like 
a master host. So he cared so deeply if he's having an event, everyone who was coming, what colors were they going to see? What is every part of the experience going to smell like? What is the imagery that we're using both video from a technology standpoint, but not so cold and dispassionate that is not connected to the vintage feeling, right? Of a loving and welcoming space. What temperature is it going to be at what time of day, right? And these things may seem small, but we're pretty obsessive about what is that checklist? Because again, to me, it's the, it's the best grace in the way to reflect you and your brand. And it's the highest compliment we can pay to our customer. Say, I care so damn much about you that I want to make sure this experience, this hospitality, this service is incredible. Last thought I want to have you share with us intention. At the core behind what you just described, I couldn't be more struck by the notion of, you know, she's talking about intention. Well, this is the missing link for, this is a bigger conversation in life in general. But, um, you know, sometimes when I'm asked about how do you stay on track in life in general, I would say like, you have to have like a quarterly business review with yourself in the mirror, right? So so every, and the attention comes back to gratitude and it also comes back to a recognition of the, if you live a hundred years, it's a short life, right? So we have to be so on purpose right, with the things that we're doing in our industry. Our industry is like the face of America. And I don't think that's um, puffery, right? You know what I mean? It really matters. So when people come here and visit, the first thing you're doing is you're going to, and you're trying to look up the best restaurant to go to, right? You're trying to look up what to buy, what to celebrate with, what to clink glasses with. And I, I do, I really take it seriously. It's incumbent upon us to be like the the elegant welcoming committee, right? To this great country that I love. It, 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 I, I'm not, it may sound a little bit hokey, but I, I really believe it and, I, and it really works when you do it right. And it's about being in service. We're in the service industry. Yes. It's a privilege to be here in this industry with you. You shine so beautifully and brightly. Would you please, when you come to the Agave Heritage Festival in the American Southwest in Arizona, please allow me to host you not just for dinner, but for some of the best tacos you might ever have. Oh, it, would be my great, it would be my great privilege. Thank you so much. I would love that. Thanks for making time to be here with us today. Dia Sims, you can find her on the web at, and we got it scrolling across the bottom, Lobo 1707 Tequila and Mezcal, found virtually everywhere in North America, for which we are enormously grateful. And the toast, one more time, Dia. Oh, uh, Legacy Love Lobos. Legacy Love Lobos. these fantastic men ian paul it's so lovely to have you here with us welcome and i raise my glass to welcome you welcome the incredible vanessa hudgens and oliver trevina hello and welcome Hi. cheers Hi. how are you doing i want to talk about the fact that the incredible padma lakshmi is joining us our extraordinary friend diane mina joins us from her home Tower, who joins us today from his home in the beautiful Merida, Mexico. He joins us now, Chef Ming Tsai. Aloha and welcome. What's going on, Jen? Good to see you. 